We're good to start. Johnson going to be on the play. They're waiting for the go-ahead, and we will go ahead. The finals here in Minneapolis underway. A Temple of Triumph to start things off here for Andrew Johnson. Take a look at the top card. See where this is going to go. And top goes to the bottom over to Bylander. Reading the Fountain, his first draw step. He does have a Temple of Enlightenment over there. You see it dissolve in hostility. Trinkle Cove as well. Devouring Light, too. So one of the matchups where not having Secret of the Way costs Andrew a little bit because I think Grizzly Bears is a card you wouldn't mind having against Jeremy's deck. A potent strategy, indeed. Yeah, no, I mean, just getting on the board early against this deck is a powerful thing to do. Another Temple here for Johnson. Take a look at the top card. Jeskai Charm goes to the bottom very quickly as well. Over to Bylander we go. Take a look at a last breath. And it looks like Andrew may be on the hunt for land number three right now. And you see a Magma Jet and a Mantis Rider over there, so you might be looking for land number three to cast that Mantis Rider. Finally, they're going to play a Flooded Strand. He'll kick it back over to Johnson. Johnson will untap his Temple of Epiphany. He might cast Magma Jet in his upkeep, or he might just hope to get there, but he's going to cast the Jet instead. He says, upstairs, put you to 18, make sure I get there. And he would have with a Flooded Strand if he'd just drawn a card. Yeah, I think I would have rather just taken the draw there because you always have the option of magma jetting at the end of the turn. So the upside of drawing an untapped land there is so high, and the cost is really pretty low. I think I would have just taken my draw there if I was Andrew. There's a strand. Pass the turn back. Kept it on top. Bylander. He's got a flood strand of his own. But he's not going to sacrifice that yet. He will draw a card. It's copy and dig through time. There's a Plains. Kick it back over to Johnson. He'll draw a card, copy of the Rabble Master. Going to sacrifice the Blood of Strand now, search up the land. So going on 19. Bylander will search as well here. Get himself an island. See, whatever. Uh, I don't think it matters too much which land Jeremy, uh, Andrew gets, rather. I guess, does he play any copies of Dig Through Time in the Main? Yeah, so probably should get an island here. See what Thready wants to go with, if it'll be Mantis Rider or Goblin Rabble Master. Again, both players have access to each other's deck list, so Andrew Johnson does know that Jeremy Bylander has access to Last Breath, a card that cannot kill the Mantis Rider. I would suspect if I'm in Andrew's seat that neither threat is likely to stick. Because three mana is where Jeremy has all the defenses available. Decisions, decisions here. I guess I prefer leading with the Rabble Master because if his only reactive card is Devouring Light, you're better served casting the Rabble Master. And there is Devouring Light. That's going to take down the Mantis Rider. Pass turn back over to Bylander who will draw. Uh, it's pretty close to a coin flip. It really it's, is. Neither threat is likely to do anything at this stage. Triangle Cove going to come in. Bylander will gain a life. Johnson will draw a card. It's a copy of Magma Jet. See the Rabble Master at the ready. Hiya. No, sir. Last breath. Though Andrew Johnson does get four life. What? Very, very what a, generous of Jeremy. What a nice guy. Dig through time, the draw. There's Radiant Fountain. Jeremy up to the original 20 as we work our way into the mid game here. Radiant Fountain probably helps a lot in this matchup. I think that would be the case, yeah. I would, I would sphinx this gentleman right now. <laughs> I like it. Boom. Let's get to work. Temple of Tiffany, the draw. Take a look at the top card. This is a spot where, if I'm in Jeremy's position right now, I feel if Andrew doesn't have a Rabble Master right now, he's dead. That's the only way he could power through this. Sure. He just passes the turn back. Over to Bylander we go. Bylander will draw cards, copy and nullify. It's an attack for three. Take a look at the top three cards. Flooded Strand and an Island among them. And this really all comes down to that third turn in the game. If Andrew takes his draw and casts a Mantis Rider, Jeremy had no defense available, and the whole tempo of this game might be different. Johnson going to lose three life here from the Sphinx. You see Bylander at the ready with the Dissolve. Here's a Magma Jet going upstairs. Bylander's going to go down to 18. He doesn't care about that burn spell. Scry two. 
Looks like a Stormbreath Dragon, one of the cards that Johnson's looking at here. Looks like he's going to keep them both. Untap and draw. Copy of Stoke the Flames. Just pass the turn back. Over to Bylander, who will untap his Sphinx and draw a card. He knew that island was on top. He kept it there, after all. So here's an attack. Scry 3, Elspeth, along with a disdainful stroke and a Plains. What Bylander's looking at. I don't mind taking a stroke here. Stoke the Flames, dig through time. There's enough targets. Sarkin. Yeah. Storm Breath as well. Yep. Island and gonna come into play. Any counterspell that can potentially line up with anything Andrew does is really, really powerful for Jeremy at this spot. We're going upstairs with the Stoke. Bylander gonna get on to 14, so looks like Johnson's on the Bernie out plan. Let's see what the draw is here. There's a Sarkin. Pass the turn back yet again. How about a dig? Shields are down. Johnson can do something special if he'd like. Jeremy's life toll is so high, though. Yeah. And he says, I'll dig as well. So this dig will resolve. And we'll see what Andrew takes here. See Jeskai Charm among them. Picks two cards very quickly. Might be a fifth land and a Jeskai Charm. Put those cards to the bottom. And now Bylander's dig will resolve. So he'll take a look at seven cards. Give me a Dissolve. Yeah, Dissolve staring him back in the face. Looks like there may be a Disdainful Stroke in there as well. You also see a Jace's Ingenuity. I'm not really interested in drawing cards, and Jeremy has uh, another dig through time to boot. I think Dissolve plus land is also acceptable. Take a draw here. Flooded Strand added to the grip. See a Tranquil Cove, too. First things first, the beatdowns with the Sphinx. Last breath and hostility is on planes. I think all of these go to the bottom. Not really interested in any of them. Yep, Jeremy agrees. He doesn't have enough mana to play the prognostic sphinx and leave up a counter spell. So again, I think Jeremy happy just passing it back. You have no to imagine reason. Jeremy likes the texture of how this game's going, No right? reason to rush anything. At 15 life, pretty comfortable. Yeah. Let's see what Johnson wants to do this turn. It looks like he might go for Sark. He's going to start by sacrificing the Flooded Strand, go down to 13. I think Andrew has the sense that things are, he's in a lot of trouble right now, but might as well make the effort. Ice Age planes. You're happy about that? I don't mind the Ice Age lands, but I think that might be because I'm nostalgic for them. Probably a little bit. Bought starter decks and play with them. They do look pretty bad for the most part. The Dragon Speaker is not resolving. That's a dissolve. Take a look at the top card from the Scry. Leave that on top pretty quickly. Bylander will draw a card. Disdainful Stroke. In for three more. Look at the Sphinx slowly work away on things. Divination among the cards. As Johnson's down to 10 now. Look at that hand. <laughs> it is rather look, potent. Look at that hand. Yeah, it is rather potent. Storm Breath dragging the draw here. Five mana. No. Absolutely not. Nullify that. Dig through time. Oh, but Wizards nerfed all the counters in the card draw. Now I can't <laughs> play control decks anymore. See As Jeremy two. plays the entire game with seven cards in hand <laughs> yeah. at all times somehow. Yeah, not every <laughs> control deck. You know, we don't need revelation. That was just a luxury. Yeah. No, Jason Nudie take their time. It's good enough. I was wondering we're going to see a control deck kind of surface up. It looks like we may have found one here. Well, the right mix of reactive cards is so important, and I think 
Banishing Light, Devouring Light, and Last Breath are a really good mixture of cards to have right now. Yeah. And also, there's no slouch either. It, it, it's so nice that you just absolutely annihilate the Devotion matchup with that card. Yep. Bylander going to untap here. Johnson's going to be going from 10 to 7 in just a second. Looks like I may start things off with the Radiant Fountain. A little scry here, Temple of Enlightenment among the cards. Looks like the land's going to go to the bottom. Someone should show Shaheen Sarani a clip of this match. And all these matches we've watched the elimination round. Too many counter spells for Shaheen, man. Sure. Shaheen loves a little tap out control deck. Here's an Elspeth. Got to accelerate things up a little bit here as there's three soldier tokens now. Though I'm sure Shaheen is very pleased. Well, that much is to be sure. He may have to go back and edit that article where he was complaining about end hostilities costing five mana. That's and how true. He's supposed to keep up with all these aggressive decks yeah. and so on and so forth. Jeremy's found a way. Shaheen was quite angry about yep. them removing four mana wraths. Quite upset indeed. See Johnson considering casting a Storm Breath Dragon. Yeah, there's that. Perhaps a Disdainful Stroke will take care of that as well. All of your spells, oh, they're countered. They're not resolving. Jason's ingenuity of the draw. Here's an attack for six. Yeah. Andrew Johnson does not want to play Magic anymore. Jerry Bylander does win at game number one here over Jess Gallagro. Blue-white control is one win away from becoming our standard Open champion. That was a beating. No two ways about that. Andrew didn't have a threat on turn three, and he never got a shot to do anything of substance. Back to the booth we go. It is time for our last premium giveaway. You've got the rules. I've got a real doozy of a question. So Cedric will ask you a question. You'll tweet your answer at SCG Live and hashtag SCG Premium. The correct responses will be selected at random for a full year of Star City Games premium content. If you are the winner, make sure you're following us on Twitter so we get the prize over to you. And please keep in mind, this giveaway is run at the sole discretion of StarCityGames.com. That Twitch TV is in no way affiliated with giveaways or contests on its stream. For Grand Prix New Jersey, it's going to be a lot of fun taking place in November from when to when. Name the dates of the Grand Prix for New Jersey. Make sure you use the hashtag, hashtag SCG Premium. Yes. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Because we got things going on on Friday, too. It's not just the main event. We do have things going on Friday. So X to Y, name the dates, hashtag SCG Premium. Make sure you're following SCG Live. We'll announce the winner at the conclusion of our final round, which Jeremy Bylander is currently leading. Again, if you've not taken a look at our player profiles and our coverage trades, I would certainly do that. Bylander saying in the player profiles, why did you choose this deck? You said it's the best deck. Very confident. Very confident, yes. And so far, looking quite good here as he is up a game against Jeskai. We'll take a look at the sideboards. We will see on the Jeskai side for Johnson, two Hushwing Griff, a Suspension Field, three Disdainful Stroke, two Negate, a Narset, a Karanos, one Anger of the Gods, two in Hostilities, and two Cops of Glare of Heresy. We're going to be playing a longer game here, most likely, which Andrew does have some things that help him in that fashion. Well, I think Glare of Heresy is good here because of Banishing Light, also because Jeremy is bringing in his copies of Nyx Fleece Ram and possibly Bramaz as well. So I think those can come in pretty easily. I think the Karanos and the Narset are well suited to playing longer games. I think the Negates and the Disdainful Strokes also are good counter spells given what Jeremy's up to. And it's possible the, sus the suspension field comes in as well. Might be an upgrade over Banishing Light. On the side of things, Bylander, third time we've seen his sideboard this morning. Two Bramas, two Wingmate Rock, four Nick's Face Ram, a Resolute Archangel, Devouring Light, Stainful Stroke, Erase, Faded Retribution, and two Negates. So I really like the Resolute Archangel. I think the Nick's Face Ram and the Wingmate Rocks will likely come in here as well. I would bring in the additional Devouring Light and the two negates. I would not mess around with Faded Retribution. Andrew's not playing that much to the board. Seems a little expensive. Yeah, it's just, it's against the green decks, one Faded Retribution is excellent. Against Andrew's deck, I think less so. Oh, don't forget, my friends, after this is over, we will announce our premium winner. We will have a winner's interview on the sideboard with Andrew Shroud for a little trophy presentation, a little break where we'll replay our finals and all of our elimination rounds, and then we come back for legacy action. We have about 250 people come play. We'll have ten round, or excuse me, nine rounds of action for you guys of legacy. We've also got our modern premiere IQ, and we have any updates on what's going on there. We'll let you guys know that as well. So I wandered around while we were waiting for this to get set up, and we're still early into the modern IQ. Don't get me wrong, but table one, 
I saw some Loxodon Spiders and some Boros Charms battling it out. Gotta love that. That, you know, just looking for someone to play the Ascendancy deck. That's just some honest magic right there, Smiters and Boros Charms. That is too honest. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably a little honest. Loxodon Smiter is the king of honesty. Because you have to be, to, to play Loxodon Smiter, you have to play first, you have to be playing green and white. So yes. you gotta be pretty honest to begin with. And second, you have to be interested in attacking and blocking. Also true. Most decks that have creatures really only want to do one or the other. The big guy. Yeah. With his big hammer. You have to be looking to play magic against your opponent to want to be casting locks on Splendor. And really, who would want to do that? That is ridiculous. When you can kill someone on the second turn or the third turn, if the rumors are to be believed, I would not be that interested in locks on Splendor. Uh, the rumors are true. They can die very quickly. So, what's your familiarity slash interest level of this deck? The Ascendancy Modern Combo. Those are two very different questions. Uh, all right, what do you perceive the power level to be? Very high. Would you play it in a tournament? No. Okay. Fortunately, I, I have not seen it in action, but my understanding is that Eidolon the Great Rebel is pretty good against it. Yeah. So I, not to worry too much. I feel so the deck is quite beatable. It is clearly powerful and good, but I think that there was a gross overreaction because I feel like, you know, when the deck is doing well initially, I think it's just catching people off guard so they don't know what's happening. When you adjust to, okay, like this is the way that I go about beating the deck, which is, you know, Eidolon of the Great Rebel, Eidolon of Rhetoric, Abrupt Decay, your Jeskai guys Ascendancy. Like there are ways and avenues to beating the deck. It's not like, you know, it's not like the Flash Grand Prix, right? Where cast sure. Flash, you lose. I have Counterbalance on top and, you know, Pact, well, Pact Negation wasn't legal for that term, but Force won all this stuff where it's just too much to overcome. I think that part of the problem is that because R&D has managed the ban list in Modern so aggressively, and they've stated publicly numerous times we want this to be a turn four or slower format, that it almost forces the community to react this way when new powerful things are happening. That said, you know, there is the Modern Grand Pro the Modern Pro Tour that's going to be taking place in Washington, D.C. I think it's Pro Tour Fate Reforged. And I would be a little scared if that card is legal and player, you know, the teams get their hands on that deck and they're just like, we're going to find the perfect build of this deck. That That's a little more scary, I think. Sure. But at this stage of things, I'm not all that uh, I'm not all that afraid. As both players do start off with some come to play tap lands, a Temple of Triumph on Johnson's side, a Tranquil Cove on Bylanders. Nile and there for Johnson. You know that things get started on turn three for Jeskai. Bylander with another Tranquil Cove in grip. So his shields are down here. No nullify. No Disdainful Stroke, though Disdainful Stroke doesn't come into play things just yet. No Last Breath for a Rabble Master. And because there's no Last Breath man up, I think this is a great spot to take Rabble Master because I think this card's more powerful than Mantis Rider on turn three, but you have to worry about Last Breath when you're on the play. Mm -hmm. And now, with the shields down, great spot to stick that card. And we know this card can run away with it all by itself. You can already feel like the tempo of this game is so much different. And uh, to, to go back to game number one, why I think Andrew should have tried to draw an untapped land on turn three. Sure. Because you can already tell this game is going to be a lot different. Bylander going to sacrifice a flooded strand, search up an island here. Rebel Masters already got him under duress. Banish Light says, get out of here, Rebel Master. And back to Johnson we go. And now Andrew has a couple options here. He can Banishing Light to Banishing Light. He can cast a Mantis Rider. All good stuff. I like Banishing Light to Banishing Light, personally. I just want to keep that advantage going with Rabble Master. There's also, it's also easier to resolve the Mantis Rider because Banishing Light gets tagged by Negate. Yep. Another goblin beatdowns for two. Mylander sign at 18. So so far so good for Mandrew. Temple of Enlightenment gonna come in. A little scry action here. Jeremy's deck is a lot less powerful when it has to react to the board early on rather than just sitting on its heels making land drops. Yeah, countering spells. Yeah. Resolving ingenuities. This is something he doesn't really want to be up against. This will be interesting to see if Johnson actually does attack with his Rabble Master this turn, since he does have to be a little wary of Devouring Light, but also, does he want to deploy this other Rabble Master in the face of almost five mana? Well, he has Negate back up this turn, so this makes it really juicy to run out the second Rabble Master. And if 
Jeremy has something like Vanishing Light. I'm not even fighting over it because the only thing I care about fighting over now is end hostilities. Andrew's board is advanced enough that, you know, one for one trades are not going to keep Jeremy in this game. He's got to sweep everything up. And of course, the Arrow Master has to attack because of the other Rabbit Master. An attempt at Devouring Light is countered by Negate. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten points of damage. It does not take long for Rebel Master to get the job done. Bylander's at eight. He draws a card, needs to beat and hostilities. It's a copy of Last Breath. And that was a really risky play by Andrew, but it looks like he is safe. I think Jeremy can only answer one of them, and he's got to tap the mat. Yeah. Andrew Johnson going to tie things up here with Jeskai Agro. We'll head to game number three between Blue Eye Control and the Jeskai deck. Goblin Rebel Master showing its power yet again. When Jeremy goes tap land, tap land, Andrew knows he can play it safely without fear of nullify, without fear of last breath. It's a very different game. I know some players have opted to remove Rebel Master for this deck for Burmaz or just try other things, more controlling shell. But in case you forgot, Goblin Rebel Master is still a hallmark threat in this format. Depends what kind of matchup you're trying to beat, but if I'm, if I'm looking to beat Jeremy, I want the Rebel Master. If it's unchecked, it's it's game over by itself. Vermaz gives him a lot of time. These players will shuffle up for game number three here. We will talk very briefly about our invitational schedule for next year. 2014 of the Open Series, oddly enough, coming to a close. Yep, we are one invitational left in the books. We have Seattle at the end of the year, and then next year, basically running back the same venues, except where we are switching the, the season one invitational from Charlotte to Richmond. And then you see Columbus, New Jersey, and Seattle for the rest of the year. So not too much of a change there. Dates are a little bit different, but locations are just about the same. Instead of Charlotte, we do go to Richmond for season one. That's about it. Should be a lot of fun. Head to Columbus for the Origins Game Fair, New Jersey. See the family again. And then Seattle, where I don't have to get in an airplane. Yeah. What a delight. But New Jersey's worth the airplane trip for me. So. Yeah, it also gives me a reason to stop at uh, home in Ohio to see the parents. That's you, you stop over in Ohio, then head out to Jersey? Yeah. I think this matchup plays a lot different with Jeremy on the play. Because I think his, it plays way different with him on the play. When he goes land drop, land drop, land drop on the play, his shields are completely up. And Andrew's deck does not get started until the third turn. There's no secret of the way here. Nothing relevant happens until the third turn. That's right. for sure. I think, it's, I think it's wildly different to the point where it almost favors Jeremy heavily to be on the play. All the things that he wants to do that matter really start on turn three. He has some things to interact on turn two, nullify and last breath, but turn three is just dissolve, devouring light, banishing light, like all this stuff. I know it might seem mopey, but I think there's an argument for Andrew bringing in Hushwing Griff in this matchup. Just so he has more threats in the deck and a way to initiate action on the end of Jeremy's turn. I don't think it's mopey for exactly that reason. A flash threat against this control deck it's a nice option to have. I know it's a small threat, not a big deal, but it's nice to have out there. You know, if I'm in Andrew's spot right now, the Magma Jets, the Lightning Strikes, the definitely the Anger of the Gods, not even, I'm not that interested in these low-impact burn spells. I would rather just have more stuff. I do wonder if there's a chance that we see Jeremy maybe flip the script a little bit, bring in Brumaz. I think that's possible. He plays that on turn number three, and now Andrew has to play defense. His deck doesn't seem all that well situated to beat the 3-4? Well, he has Banishing Lights and two copies of Glare of Heresy in his sideboard, so I think Bermaz is a long shot. Okay. Didn't forget about the Glares. I think it's more attractive on the play. I agree with you in that respect. Oh, I hate it on the draw. If I'm Jeremy, I would not side in Bermaz. Okay. I think Andrew has enough answers, and you kind of have to have it on turn three for it to be meaningful. Sure. And if you tap out on turn three and Andrew has a Mantis Rider, it's not even clear you've accomplished very much. Yeah, I mean, I think there's just a draw that exists where, you know, you play Bermaz on turn three, he plays something on turn three, be it, a rabble ma be it a Rabble Master or a Mantis Rider, you get that off the board with a Banishing Light or something, or you have a Devouring Light at the ready, and then you're just kind of rocking and rolling from there. Yeah, you can you can definitely get awesome draws that involve Bermaz, but I think it's too too much of a long shot. We'll see how Bylander does sideboard and how things do play out in our... Third and final game of our Standard Open here this morning. Winner of this game wins the match, and the tournament will be our Standard Open champion here in Minneapolis. And this could be a big shift if Jeremy wins this tournament, because we haven't really seen this going on, and 
his deck is quite a bit different than the, even the other control lists, which have been fairly marginalized and standard since Concentric Heroes become legal. I think even if he doesn't win the tournament, he has made a huge impact on the standard format. Yeah. People do get hung up on the winner, though, rationally or otherwise, you know? Just the way these things work. Oh, Vinelander on the play. Take a look at the grip. I think the negates and the disdainful strokes, though, in Andrew's sideboard are problematic for Jeremy. Looks like Johnson's going to keep, as will Bylander. It's a temple to start it up. Johnson will draw. Mystic Monastery is his first land. Another temple. You also see a Nyx Fleece Ram. Yep. Maybe a little bit of a surprise there to see that after sideboard. No, I like the Ram. I thought he was going to bring it in. Okay. Another Monastery here for Johnson. He'll kick it back. Action doesn't start until turn three for Jeskai. By Lander up to 21. Because in this matchup, I think Jeremy wants to de-emphasize his sweepers a little bit anyway. I don't think he wants to be leaning on end hostility, so. Flooded Strand is land at number three. Going to sacrifice that right away. Not as good as it is against Mono Red Aggro, but I think still worth bringing in. Let's see if Bylander is up to anything this turn. See the hand dissolve over there, some other cards. Monastery number three, the draw here for Johnson. See what land he wants to play and how he wants to move forward. Also, the Ram, I think, has to come in in the event that Jeremy brought in Wingmate Rock, which I think he might have. Sure. Because you, you need to beat down. You do need an attacker. <laughs> three mana. Robert Rostrum. I think that Johnson knows whatever this is is probably not resolving. So I'm just trying to figure out, okay, what's the spell I'm going to throw away to a counter spell? He does have two Rebel Masters and a Mantis Rider in his hand. And he shrugs his shoulders and says, Goblin Rebel Master? I think this is, if this is Mantis Rider, there's no hesitation for Jeremy to dissolve it. But because... He has the next place ran that might make it just attractive enough to let this resolve. That said, his hand needs help, and scrying is really important for him right now. His hand is four lands and a dissolve. I want to lance as a Temple of Epiphany, but he needs help, as you mentioned. Top card is an Elspeth. That's... It's a risky card to keep on top because he's got to hold the four for three turns, and Elspeth does not necessarily stabilize this game. Yeah, if you cast Elspeth, there's no guarantee that one, it's going to resolve, or two, as you said, it's going to stabilize the game. Against Mantis Riders and Burn Spells? I think Jeremy needs to put this on the bottom. I don't think Elspeth will do enough this game. Or at least not on turn six. Maybe somewhere down the line it matters, but not right now. He's thinking long and hard about this scry. This is a tough scry. This might be the entire game, match, and tournament right here. But I think he's got to put this on the bottom. See the hand, Radiant Fountain, Temple, a couple more lands, bottoms up goes the Elspeth. Time to gain a life with the Ram, up to 21. Let's see what the draw is going to be. Nullify. Bob the Elspeth, pick up a counter spell. Yeah. Perfect. Not scripted any better. Temple, take a look. Don't have a great look here. Though it looks as though he kept that one pretty fast. Ram <laughs> Ram with the bluff attack. Yeah. His deck has Rabble Master, so you probably don't want to attack right now. <laughs> there is a another Rabble Master. That will be nullified. Though we could see a real attack with the Ram if Wingmate Rock is on top. Gain a life, 22. Draw a card. The Resolute Archangel. That's actually kind of funny. Yeah. His life total's <laughs> a little too high for that one. Glare Harris, the draw. There's Plains. Is it time for Mantis Rider, or do we go a little bit bigger for Andrew Johnson? I think Mantis Rider plus, plus Glare of Heresy is really attractive because the Zaneful Stroke does not break this up at all. Mm -hmm. If he wants to negate this Glare of Heresy, I think you're probably happy with that exchange. The draw is a Tranquil Cove. Holding off on the Glare, which I guess is fine. It's it is risky against a deck with Wingmate Rock to let him have that ram. But yeah. It is 
Not the most powerful card that Jeremy can have, but it is the only thing and a little bit risky. Just gain a life, pass it back. Battlefield Forge in for three. Bylander down to 18. You see the Stormbreath Dragon there, dig through time in the grip. Happy to just play this kind of game as Johnson. Yep. Not willing to put anything else on the table. Ram will put Bylander up to 19. Last breath to draw. It's an island. Kick it back over to Johnson, who will draw. Just got Charm in for three. He likes playing this sort of one thread at a time game. Kick it back over to Bylander, who's up to 17. No reason for Andrew to move as long as Jeremy's not moving. This kind of game favors Johnson, in my opinion. Radiant Fountain. Pass it back. Jessica Charm is going upstairs. Andrew's hand's getting a little bottlenecked right now, so I don't mind deploying these, especially because he has uh, Dig Through Time in his deck. Yep. So this just leads to other efficiencies down the road. We're going upstairs again. Bylander down to 11. Time to untap and take a draw. Didn't get a great look, but I know Mantis Rider's coming in for three. I think three. that was the Hushwing Griff, which I like. Bylander's down to eight. Also, Jeremy has Wingmate Rock in his deck, I guess, so sure. He also has Resolute Archangel in his hand. Yeah, also pretty nice against that card. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, it's not bad. Nope. That might come up. See, Bylander's up to 10. Johnson will draw a card. Fluttertrain directly comes into play. Mantis Rider for a little bit more, down to seven. And Andrew just not willing to commit anything. He's not even trying to resolve this dig through time. Yeah, super patient. And super patient. I mean, at some point, Jeremy's got to make a move, right? He's got to cast an Elspeth or, or something. And then Andrew has, he can dig through time and Stormbreath Dragon plus whatever he has on his follow ups. So he's sandbagging a really potent hand. And there's a temple. Take a look at the top. Looks to be a Banishing Light. It's finally an answer to the Mantis Rider. It's pretty late to the party, though. You see the hand there for Bylander. Last breath, Resolute Archangel on a Flooded Strand. The draw is another Mantis Rider. Jeremy's trying to squeeze every ounce out of this Resolute Archangel. Absolutely. I mean, there's a risk he just dies there. Sure. But he also may just be convinced Andrew has Disdainful Stroke. And he's trying to have some sort of setup here. Up to six. Take a draw. Banishing Light's what he's found. There's the Archangel. I uh, no, I think he's just leading off to the light here. Oh, excuse me. I do take that back. The Archangel will probably be the follow-up. This is, I suppose, the counterspell bait. All right, he says, you got my Manus Rider. Pass it back. Hushwing? Maybe Dig? Maybe both. Sacrifice this fetch land first. See what our number one overall seed wants to do here on Bylander's end step. I think this is a good spot to try to resolve a couple spells. I think so too. I mean, Andrew's been patient. That's great, but there's the Griff. See if this is good to go. The two-one flyer, modern implications, but well, making an appearance in standard as well. I think Jeremy has last breath in hand, so he Does. doesn't have to worry about this. Thing about last breath though, you know, does he want to target that or does he want to target his own creature to gain for life? Looks like he's going to go after the Griff. Well, he's playing towards Resolute Archangel anyway, so he has to get this off the table. Sure, sure. It's time to dig it up. And I think Jeremy's probably surprised to see this because he's wondering why this didn't get cast a while ago. Take a look at the top seven. A lot of lands in there. Rabble Master, another dig though. We are at Andrew's upkeep when this is all happening. So we can't forget, he hasn't even drawn a card yet this turn. I 
Looks like last breath is going to resolve. Yep. So Johnson's going to gain some life here. And we will make sure that he does draw a card for the turn, and he does. Sarkin. Oddly enough, I don't know if he has a, a land to play this turn, to play Storm Breath or Sarkin. It doesn't look like he does. Well, this is the risk of being as patient as Jeremy, or excuse me, as Andrew has been, is he's not going to be able to play multiple spells in a turn, or it's going to be very challenging for him to do so. And he's going to use the glare on the Banishing Light. Okay. Get his Mantis Rider back. Beat downs. Push you to three. I mean, if he could cast anything else in his hand right now, he would have won this game. Well. But he has no follow-up. And now it looks like Jeremy's going to be able to claw back. <laughs> to put it mildly. Well, there's no time like the present. There's Resolute Archangel. Andrew's got to do all the work again, but he's got a lot of great tools in his hand to do that. Yeah, his hand's loaded. But Jeremy waited until the last possible second to deploy this. So back to 20 we go. Johnson going to untap and draw. We know he's got Storm Breath over there. Sarkin, too. And with an opponent who can't attack, I think this is a good opportunity to Sarkin take care of the Archangel, leave up Negate, and then start attacking for a lot next turn. There's the attack. This is Devouring Light. I think. Certainly thinking about it. It's tough. I mean, maybe he needs to save it for the Sarkin next turn, yeah. you know? It would be easy just to kill this yeah. right now. Because if Jeremy has brought in the Wingmate Rocks, he at least has that as a draw. Yep. He can take this hit, untap, draw Wingmate Rock, attack with the next place Ram, play the Wingmate Rock, devour and light the Sarkin, the 3-4 is check the 3-3, three, three, and you're starting to draw cards again. Yeah, Bylander's thinking about this for a long time, though. Is this the best target for my Devourer Lights? I don't have anything else. I have a Flooded Strand. I have nothing else. Looks like he's going to take the three, pass the turn back. Trigger the Ram, back up to 18. Let's see what the draw is here. It's a copy of Banishing Light. It's not so bad. Jeremy needs one of his power cards right now, though. That's the problem. Yeah, ingenuity, Dig, Elspeth, something. The board's fairly bad, and Andrew has five cards in hand. So he's not going to be able to win this just by drawing good cards in a row, good individual cards in a row. He's got to chain together some card drawing. I'll tap three mana. It's a Banishing Light. See what the target's going to be. Mantis Rider and Sarkin are both pretty interesting. Assuming that this even resolves, as Johnson does have the negate that he's looking at. I'm not touching any of these kind of cards if I'm Andrew. He is going to negate here, but... Uh, again, I have the resources in the mana now to win on a one-for-one -one basis, so I'm only going to negate things that allow Jeremy to claw ahead on cards or do something significant. Elevator going up on Sarkin. It's an attack for seven in the air. There's a Devouring Light to take care of the Planeswalker. Here at least an attempt as Johnson does bring the dig through time forward, and it looks like he's going to cast this dig through time. Maybe in search of a counterspell. So here it is. The powerful Delve spell will allow Johnson to look at the top seven cards of his deck. We'll see if he finds what he's looking for in response to this Devouring Light. And he's found a negate very quickly. Disdainful Stroke, Karanos as well. A lot of power here. Yeah. Looks like he's going to go with another counter spell here. Let's see, maybe he's shaking his head a little bit. Don't know if he cares about the Devouring Light now that he's found counters. But he will fight over this. This is opening the window a little bit for Bylander to top deck. If Bylander is able to find, you know, Jace's Ingenuity or Dig, he can start clawing back, potentially. First things first, we trigger the Ram. Up to 12. Even Windmink Rock gives him a little bit of play. Take a draw. Just a disdainful stroke. Nothing great there. Back Johnson's way. Johnson has a disdainful stroke of his own in hand. Draws a mountain for the turn. He will deploy that. 
Jig up the Sarkin. Get in for seven in the air yet again. Bylander's going to go down to five. You see the Rabble Master, but Johnson has not had any interest in deploying any more threats than necessary. Ram's going to bring Bylander up to six. The draw is a copy of Dig Through Time. Johnson has a card that starts with a D as well that takes care of that one. Well, I'm curious to see if Andrew wants to counter this or if he saves it for whatever the follow-up oh, is. Oh, I would be surprised yeah. if he did not counter this spell with the Stainful Stroke, and he will. And Jeremy will look at his Stainful Stroke along with his Flooded Strand. He will extend the hand. Andrew Johnson with the Fist Pump is going to win our Standard Open here in Minneapolis. Two games to one. Jeskai does it again. And for our number one overall seed, he made it look pretty easy this morning. Tough matchup there in the finals, I think. In the post-board configuration, when Andrew has access to counter spells and more threats, it's a tough mixture for Jeremy to get through. And you can tell the difference between Supreme Verdict and End Hostilities. You can attack these control decks with counter spells. It's night and day. It's much different magic. Four mana Wrath makes it different, and you know I think a lot of people took for granted the fact that Supreme Verdict was uncounterable. That matters because hey, you used to be able to just counter Wraths and keep going about your business. At some point, we got used to it, right? Because yep. we stopped building decks with creatures and counter spells in them. Because why would we bother? Yep. You know, Mono Blue Devotion was an exception to that rule, but they had all sorts of different things that allowed it to have staying power against those kind of decks. But we weren't building, you know, blue green beatdown with some mana leaks to keep people off of Wrath of God. You know, those kind of classic decks. Those strategies are viable again. Very good run for Jeremy. A lot of information to be taken from his success in this tournament. But the structure of Jeskai in the post-board games, I think, is problematic for the way that his deck is built. And yet again, we watch another match with Jeskai where it plays a Mantis Rider and defends the Mantis Rider.